Uh, and those on the outside to come on in, we got plenty. Well, we have a few seats, but Mr. Chairman, I think we're going to have a packed house. Uh, that's very good. I'm so delighted to welcome our keynote speaker, uh, actually the first speaker of Super Mobility Week. Couldn't have a, a, a better person to kick this off. And uh, instead of giving a prepared speech, uh, Mr. Wheeler has decided um, maybe we should just have a fireside chat. And I told him that I'd feel really uneasy sitting down to have a fire fireside chat with the, 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 the inventor of the telecommunications fireside chat. But I'd, uh, I figured I'd go on and try to do it. Uh, I note that um, um, we've been doing this for a while, uh, years earlier, and, and you know, I used to work for this gentleman, and he always asked me tough questions. Uh, so I thought maybe it was my opportunity to, <laughs> to maybe ask a couple tough questions of him. Um, so uh, why don't we uh, why don't we invite the chairman up, give him a round of applause. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Have a seat. Um, so, Steve, um, listen, uh, we're, we're interested in how you decided to get into this industry and uh, the, all the things that you've been doing at CCA. So tell me, what's your agenda? Um, there's this guy by the name of Mr. Wheeler who said I should get involved in wireless. I, I'll never forget the day that uh, he called me up was, uh, to offer me a job. I was on a wireless phone. It was the old Motorola flip yeah, phone. Right. I remember I was on Capitol Hill, and he said, yeah. And I, it was historic, but he's, he said, this is the first you know, first positive, you know, economic uh, impact you've had from a wireless device. So I said yes. <laughs> so, uh, uh, why don't we start out? Uh, you know, we know we wanted to welcome the chairman, and we thought we'd do it in some of the technology that he's probably most interested in. Well, he's pro probably used it in his early years. I think. <clears throat> I think the Morse code was uh, was was actually being used. <clears throat> uh, by the time, uh, and that does say uh, CCA welcomes FCC chairman in Morse code. It's so, really so. Uh, this you know, is first class, Steve. Yeah, I, I, I thought. I, I thought, thought there was a squeaky brake on a <laughs> little cart going by here or something. Boy, okay. have we have we uh, progressed here? And uh, and as you know, I mean, he he he's a policy expert, and uh, we'll go through some of his characteristics here. Uh, not only is he great great person, policy expert, industry thought leader. We know that about uh, Tom Wheeler. He's an author and historian, uh, which we uh, have had the opportunity to, to get to know. A business innovator. He's not only an innovator, but he's an uh, entrepreneur, and he's a serial entrepreneur. Uh, it's, it's, there's so many lists of his accomplishments. Investment guru. <clears throat> and I know that uh, one of the most important uh, you know, characteristics is he's uh, he also has uh, Papa. And so I thought we would maybe uh, identify some of the priorities and one of the more important non-public you know, aspects of his life. And so I thought we'd bring in some, a little flavor. We've got, All right. We've got Papa here talking. With Hunter. That's yeah, Hunter. That's, that's to, to Hunter. And, uh, and then after that, you know, here, here we go. <laughs> he's, he's, you know, he's having that's, a big time at home. Look at that. And then we, we got it. Here we go. Here's all three. All three of them. Yeah, Hunter, that's, that's uh, Hunter Melvin, and Skyler. And Melvin and Skyler. Yeah. So the, Life doesn't really, get much better than that. They look a lot like their mother, you know. That's probably, you know. Hey. And then here's, uh, here's a picture. So we thought we'd just continue this for a while. It would be totally embarrassing. But, but we wanted to thank the family for sharing Tom, not only with uh, us here, but <clears throat> with the public sector and the public policy agenda. Um, the time they uh, are spending away from him, uh, I think we're all going to benefit from. But the entire Wheeler crew, I think, needs a round of applause. Well, so thank you. Really nice. <clears throat> you know, Steve, and, and you understand. I mean, one of the fascinating things, because because when you were doing public service with Jim Baker and everybody at the at the State Department, and then on the Hill in the multiple positions you had, one of the things people don't understand is it is a team effort. You know, and when you've got a team, you know, like that, Nicole, Melvin, little Melvin, whoever that gray-haired guy is, <clears throat> Skyler, uh, Hunter, and Carol, you Carol. just can't do much better. Well, we 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 have some very little little scene uh, scenes 
you, when you would think that when Tom is at home with his, the grandkids, he's just focused on family. But I think we have some uh, couples. See, uh, <laughs> this this is a one of he's. he's I'm going to kill Melvin. He's recruiting. I he's, am going to. Is Melvin in the audience? Can I? Because I know we didn't give you these pictures. But, but the, you know he's you know he's he's always working. So when he's at home, here, here's got Melvin trying to help figure out this connected car thing. You know, yes. and then you know we we check back from time to day. Two days later. <laughs> Done. You know? So, you know, I, he, he brings that vim and vigor and, and, and dedication to all aspects of his life, and, uh, and we're very much appreciative of that. That's fun, Steve. So, so I figured I'd, I'd do the Mr. Wheeler thing. I think I have him over here. Pull out the cards. You, you remember? It had to be a certain size card on the certain, you know, Look got at that, that logo you, on the you back. You've got your so you, logo on the back. So you can read that. Um, so I thought we'd go in and, sub, uh, you know, the oxygen issues. I mentioned the oxygen issues for our carriers, you know, spectrum, um, spectrum issues, um, the um, issues around the network and roaming, and then devices um, and universal service. And I thought we'd sort of try to focus on some of those. Spectrum, number one, thank you. Everyone in this room from the bottom of our hearts, thank you for the effort that you put in to create the 600 megahertz framework, <coughs> auction framework, the fact that partial economic areas uh, will give every one of our carriers an opportunity to show up at the auction and actually explain. Well, that was your idea. Well, we... Okay, I mean, let's give credit where credit's due. I mean, for, so first of all, I don't deserve the credit for this. People like Roger Sherman and, uh, and the folks in the Wireless Bureau, Roger's over here. Yeah, Some Roger, place, there he is. Renee. And the team that he's got, you know, um, and Renee Gregory in, in my office, who is the, uh, the, the legal advisor on Wireless Matters, they're the ones who made this all work. I'm just the guy that gets to <laughs> stand up front and give the roar. Yeah, stand up front and take the full onslaught if it didn't turn out well, I know. But thank you. And, and the reserve, never been done before. Um, I think it was a, just a, um, a, your understanding of what uh, competition is and, and, can, and can do and can mean to the market. Um, I think it, it um, I don't think we'd ever had that without that, that understanding. And we appreciate it. Um, and we hope that it's going to be a very successful auction. And I've told you before, what can we do? How can our carriers help make sure that it's a successful auction? Show up. You know, I mean, I, that's, a, I, that's, a, that's a, a, a flip answer. But um, maybe you've noticed that um, there is a section, a segment of the broadcast industry that is very forcefully advocated by the NAB that is not exactly a fan of this auction. And, um, and the NAB and others have been saying that um, there's not going to be enough folks from the wireless industry show up uh, to make it worthwhile economically to, for, the, for the broadcasters to sell their spectrum. Um, and so it's really crucial that you show up and that you, by the way, say, hello, I'm going to show up now. Uh, one of the concerns I've got uh, about the recent lawsuit that the NAB right. filed to block the rules or to differ with the um, manner in which we have determined to carry out the mandate of Congress, um, one of the concerns I have is that it's going to not only slow the process, which is something they say is not their intention, but my goodness, I mean, we're not going to be finished with the filings in court till just before <clears throat> Christmas. Um, and it's awful hard to hold an auction in the middle of 2015 if you're still submitting papers on the, on the 18th <clears throat> of December. But the other thing that's, that's, that's even more invidious is the fact that um, it sows um, misunderstanding, it sows insecurity, it sows um, people saying, well, I really don't know whether I should put my spectrum up and because it's 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 all it's all so unknown. What's the court gonna say? How's the wireless industry gonna respond? So so the, the answer is, you know, with, you know, 
the NAB suit is what the NAB suit is, and we will deal with it. We are absolutely, positively convinced that we have done what the Congress instructed us to do. Oh, yeah. And they differ with it. It's their right to go to court. Um, um, but, and we'll work our way through that. But um, the wireless industry now saying, yes, we're interested in bidding. AT&T has said we're interested in bidding. Dish has said we're interested right. in bidding. Uh, when Sprint and Timo were talking about, uh, about uh, doing joint bidding, there were some big numbers kicked around there. Um, but, but, but somebody has to put a stake in the heart of this ugly rumor that the wireless industry isn't interested. I, 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 I can tell you from the conversations we've had since we've been here and before, uh, we've got a room full of interested bidders, and they're going to show up. It bothers me. Um, what you've provided is an opportunity for the broadcasters to, to, um, to literally get uh, cash um, from a... Um, a resource that was provided to them from the ta American taxpayer. They don't have to go out of business. They can relocate and continue their business uh, opportunities. Uh, more efficient utilization of the spectrum is the result. It's going to be economic growth and, and, and opportunities for everyone. As much as a trillion dollar of <clears throat> trillion dollars of economic growth generated by this new capability. And, um, you know, you have to sort of bite your tongue just a little uh, I mean, when you're in the wireless industry, to wonder why um, the broadcasters are not going to uh, recognize the, the better, more efficient utilization of the spectrum, and everyone can benefit. So. Well, I think some broadcasters do. And, I think, and I've talked to a bunch of broadcasters, including some that, would, that, are, that, are, that are household names that would surprise you who have said that they're looking very seriously uh, at, at this. And, and as you just pointed out, I mean, the whole concept of what you can do when you spectrum share. You know, if I came to you and said, um, Steve, I'd like to buy your spectrum from you um, and not change your existing business model so you can continue to broadcast the same programs and sell the same advertising. But I'm going to write you a check for millions and millions and millions of dollars. Please. How do you, you know, that's, that's you, can, you can dividend it out to your shareholders, you can go to Maui, or you can uh, invest it right. in new businesses. What a great opportunity. I, I think it is. I'm, I think you're going to see the wireless uh, uh, carriers show up, especially the small carriers, the way you constructed the, the auction. Um, they have to get into the 600 megahertz ecosystem. They have to get to 4G. Uh, that's a platform for it, so, yep. uh, so we thank you. Why don't we move uh, to another issue, roaming. <clears throat> um, you know, when, and when we first started out at CTI, we were sitting there with less than 50 million wireless subscribers in the, in the United States. And everyone needed everyone else in order to provide enough coverage so that it was a meaningful product to the customer. <clears throat> and over the, the last 10 or years or so, we've had enormous uh, consolidation in the tier two uh, area. And uh, we've got a duopoly that, uh, it, that is large enough that they don't feel like they have to <clears throat> particularly be as cooperative on the, the roaming side. Um, as uh, business sort of dictated, dictated a, a decade ago. I'm not aware of any, and maybe I'm wrong, but if somebody please correct me, but I, I'm not aware of any 4G LT roaming agreements that AT&T has with non-AT&T entities. And other than the LRA program, I'm, I'm not aware of any 4G LT roaming agreements that Verizon has with, with, uh, with others. So it, it makes you wonder if, um, is the roaming mandate, is the roaming relationship, is the roaming marking working for the smaller carriers, and is it time that, to maybe look at tweaking it or making sure that uh, that 4G LT roaming uh, is not a different animal than 3G when it comes to connectivity uh, for the smaller carriers? Well, I think the first thing is to recognize the leadership that Mignon Clyburn had when she was chairwoman and what she did to move things along on on roaming. 
Um, secondly is, um, is let's look at the reality. So, so Timo, T-Mobile, has petitioned us to look at four specific comparative kinds of tests in terms of determining, determining whether a roaming agreement is commercially reasonable. Commercially reasonable. Um, and um, comments on that closed a couple of weeks ago, 20th of August. Um, I'm really interested in, in what the Bureau is going to be bringing back um, on that and, and hope that that will be something that will move, um, that will not drag its feet. Um, so you got, you got that sitting there. You've got the opportunity that we could take a look at some kind of enforcement advisory. You know, I don't know whether you've noticed, but we've got a new approach to enforcement at the FCC, um, where we recruited a former prosecutor yeah, no, a and several other former prosecutors um, to think more aggressively in terms of how we want to be making sure that the rules are adhered to. So one of the other options is to take a look at an enforcement advisory. Um, but the other part is there's nothing that's standing between you and your members bringing a complaint to us under the existing rules right now. Um, you don't have to wait for us to sit around and say, <clears throat> well, of those four things that, that Timo talked about, we think maybe this or that or whatever the case may be. You don't need to think, wait for an enforcement advisory. Come in, put the, put the bloody shirt on the table, and make us deal with it. I think there may have been uh, one or more uh, Filed in a confidential fashion, but there, there, um, have, there have been there have been a couple. Uh -huh. I think the number is two mm -hmm. um, that have been filed, um, and I understand the need for confidentiality. But the other part about it is, you're asking us, or at least Timo is asking us, to set up and say, well. What are the principles? The other way you get an answer on principles is through case law. Yeah. yeah. Okay? Um, and that's not done in secret. No, it's not. <clears throat> but you can imagine the, the potential retaliatory impact from some of the smallest of the smaller carriers. Um, you may be in the right, but uh, you'll be a, a, a long way from surviving very long. Um, in some situations, so it's a it's a two-edged sword. I understand and, entirely the the, the, the reality. And, and of course, the declaratory ruling was considered a, uh, another form of complaint under the, the the original rules themselves. But we really do appreciate you taking a look at. It. I know that the, the wireless bureau is looking at it, and I, we look forward to working with them. Uh, why don't we move real quick to another issue that <clears throat> I know it's one of your favorites in uh, universal service and. You know, there's a, it's a very complicated, a lot of moving parts, four different, um, you know, uh, pots of money. Most people focus on the, um, the, the larger pot, the uh, high cost fund. And, and I was trying to figure out how do we raise this issue of how meaningful is this to war, small wireless carriers, uh, and especially in those rural areas. And, and, you know, I remember you said, you know, you've got to be visual. And, uh, and so, I, I, so we try to take a a page out of your book and try to be visual. And I thought we'd give you an idea of that this is what, uh, the first visual is, this is what it feels like if you're a small carrier and you have uh, uh, fewer wireless uh, opportunities for USF and, uh, and you're, you're frozen and, and you're, and, and, and so this is, this is the small amount of USF. And I thought we'd go on and run this. That's that's a small amount of USF. Yeah, but I know what's coming. <laughs> and then and then there's another version of it that, that what could we do? What is the throughput? What would the consumer the, satisfaction level be if you had a lot more funds for USF? So we. Oh. So that's a just a deluge of, of potential. And that's what you. So would, you cut out 
Melvin. Yeah, big Melvin. Cut out Melvin coming, throwing the rest. Of, you know, we, we we like to be selective with our data, also, just like that. <laughs> and 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 so, with a longer conversation, we can share the rest of the video. But uh, but uh, but seriously, on the USF, the, our smaller carriers, we already have a couple examples where smaller carriers have pulled out and shut down towers, and and you know, we don't want to see the rusty tower syndrome. You know, when when uh, OPEX it costs more than um, than the, the revenue you can get. And what happens, especially in the Montana example, they shut down a service. Uh, one of our carriers pulled out, uh, the larger carrier that bought the Spectrum is not gonna, not gonna continue to operate because it's not cost efficient. So universal service, there's some value to mobility. And, and I would like to, uh, our carriers would like to have that discussion and, and recognize that uh, the first adopter from a broadband, high-speed mobile broadband, is, 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 is wireless. And there's still places out there uh, that our uh, guys and gals that are running their, these small systems <clears throat> are trying to provide service and cannot do so in those most difficult-to-reach areas without some uh, USF. So we appreciate the fact that you've, you've stopped the drawdown on the, the legacy mm -hmm. system. We hope that you uh, diligently look at the mobility too and crafting it and hopefully looking at the, the need uh, and get that design before there's a further drawdown. Because, you know, that, and, I, and I, everybody should know that this happened uh, in a previous uh, administration, 2011, long before Mr. Wheeler got there. And sometimes it's like the game of golf, you know, you gotta play the ball where you find it. And uh, he found, in my opinion, he found the ball pretty much in a rough. And, um, uh, and getting it back out into a uh, playable lie is sometimes a difficulty. Well, I mean, first of all, rusty tower syndrome. Yes. That is a great term. It's, you know. Well played. Yeah. Um, but, you know, and, and I don't think it's fair to, to, to Julius, uh, what, what you said. I mean, um, uh, he took on, he and the, the commission took on some major issues and how do you <clears throat> rethink how universal service works. But let's go to the roots of the issue here. Um, universal service is a fee assessed on American subscribers for the purpose of delivering service where it isn't otherwise available. And so the first thing that I'm always reminding myself is that it's not my money. And, um, and, and we have a fiduciary responsibility with that money. Okay. Second thing is that the Congress has said to us um, that universal service is an important component of telecommunications policy and that we have to have universal access. Now the fascinating thing that's going on right now and the, the reality that everybody in this room is having to live through is that as we move to LTE, universal service is also on the way to becoming universal broadband. Right. And, um, and so uh, what I think we have to make sure that we adhere to is that this is spending other people's money to deliver service where it otherwise will not be available. That if there is a comparable service being provided, um, that it then uh, universal service is, is inappropriate. And the fascinating thing about this point in time is that we're just seeing what the reality is with LTE and LTE being built out um, across the country. And I think that if we were to rush headlong into decisions about a mobility fund that 
were premature before the private market had an opportunity to ter determine where are unserved areas that are worthy of, of subsidy, um, that we would be subject appropriately to, uh, to serious, uh, serious complaints. And um, so what we've got is a further notice on the whole right. question of CAF, I'm sorry, of mobile. Um, and, um, and we're going to be looking at all these issues. But I, I, first principles are that universal service is designed to deliver service where there is none. <clears throat> I, I appreciate I think we have a chart. Uh, I don't know if it's up there about uh, the money itself. This is pretty sophisticated <clears throat> lobbying. Um, you know, here I am. I, I've got to read this now, don't I? Yeah. It's, huh? <clears throat> um, you know, the, the, the issue, though, is the, the drop from, you know, the, the precipitous drop uh, in the wireless down to 9%, the before and after. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I don't know that the public, that the private sector in and of itself will actually take advantage of building out all the LTE uh, in the areas that, that this is particularly designed to help. <clears throat> I'd hate to arrest that um, that initiative, especially since we're getting you know your your 600 megahertz uh, uh, auction and getting into the 600 megahertz ecosystem is <clears throat> is key to this. And and I don't want I would not like to arrest or slow down that adoption uh, of a, a broadband from a high speed mobile broadband in rural areas uh, because of a lack of of um, a funding uh, on on the USF. I I would love to have not only continue conversation with the, with the Bureau, but bring some information in and show that, that you know, in the rest of the world, uh, a lot of their broadband, you know, figures are based on high-speed mobile broadband. And I think it can be one of the problems you have is, is adoption of broadband in some areas because of low-income minorities, the young, those that can't afford. And um, most of the people are in, in these difficult situations using mobile to access the Internet access the, uh, the broadband capability. And, um, you know, having, I remember years ago, you remember when we fought uh, to get uh, ETC status for Western Wireless, and uh, we were trying to go from 54 KB to, you know, one meg, uh, and we got it. John Stanton and Western Wireless delivered it, and two years later, uh, they were out of business because of the wireline guys came in actually and upgraded their networks and actually put them out of business through a competitive process. I think we have an opportunity for wireless to push uh, broadband across the board, wireline and wireless. And I don't think we should. Uh, so I read your comments. Yeah. I thought your comments were excellent. Um, well rationed. Well, good rationale. I mean, let me just go back to first principles. One, we're working with other people's money. Two, we have a mandate that says where comparable service otherwise is not available. And three, wisdom says, let's make sure that we're not substituting our guess for what is reality in the rollout of next generation. Because, fourth point, I agree totally, wireless broadband is a great opportunity for unserved areas. And we appreciate your comments the other day and your, your, your broadband discussion about the, the promise of wireless. Our goal is to live up to those promises, and uh, we're going to work hard at it. Why don't we move on to the, another issue, devices. And I know that this is a tough one. This is a tough one for you. But, you know, we did a study last year, and current analysis showed that uh, like 80% of the rural uh, subscribers wanted to buy a new phone. 40% mm -hmm. of them thought they had fewer choices. And another aspect of the study showed that over 60, right at 60% of the consumers look to the device before they look to the carrier that they're going to, mm -hmm. you know, acquire. So <clears throat> if you don't have those devices, you don't have those iconic devices, how can small carriers without that expect the consideration from the consumer. And, and I know the device issue is extremely difficult for the FCC, but having an open, uh, transparent dialogue about why is it that, you know, there's a big company tomorrow is gonna announce a new uh, iPhone 6, and you, uh, I've talked to them on numerous occasions. We still, we still probably have over 70 carriers 
that would love to be able to get an, buy an iPhone and put it on their network and use it, and, and they can't. The OEM is not built to provide that type of access. And what it ends up is being a technology denial in rural regional markets. And it, it is exceedingly difficult for small carriers to remain competitive. So devices continue to be a huge problem. We've tried to help ourselves a little with the device hub that you know that Sprint's mm -hmm. helping with. Um, but again, it's, it, I, I think if there was an open dialogue about what is it that uh, it hampers device manufacturers, OEMs, from providing devices and sort of in real time to smaller carriers, if, if we can do something to help that out, like the hub or the a device hub or distributors, we would do it. Uh, you know, you have a pretty big bloody pulpit uh, that just say, listen, I'm... Bloody pulpit? Bloody like, sometimes pulpit. it feels like that. Uh, that, that, that you can raise uh, a little so, attention but here's the, to so, 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 Steve, you're as sharp a lawyer as I've come across. Um, tell me where um, the FCC's authority to deal with devices is. Well, you do have a license authority for all devices that are, you, utilize Spectrum. And I would say that you would want to make we sure have, that those we have, devices... We, we have technical authority. T technical authority, and you'd like to make sure that they work and, uh, and that... Uh, and we've talked about the importance of interconnection and right. all of this sort of stuff. I mean, I, I don't disagree with what you're saying, okay? I mean, I think your point is really well taken. Um, under the current scope of the authority of the Act, I'm not sure what authority. If you're saying, can, can, can we be talking about, hey, there needs to be more of this, of, of course. Um, if I put it, but, if I said, should OEMs be making decisions about how many competitive carriers exist in every market? Because that's really what we're talking about here. These decisions are made by manufacturers and they have a real direct impact on whether or not there's gonna be one, three, four, or five competitors in a marketplace. And I'm not saying that you have to uh, a declare a dictum or some type of uh, uh, a regulatory uh, response, but uh, opening the discussion, like you're having some discussions, we'll talk about in a minute through, mm -hmm. throughout the, the United States, mm -hmm. uh, roundtable discussions. <clears throat> I think opening up a dialogue and bringing the OEMs uh, and to say how how can we how how can carriers and how can OEMs work so I know that together? you're a shy and retiring guy and I, you haven't asked the OEMs that at all have you so what do they say when you ask them uh, it, 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 it scale uh, I won't tell you the, the so you tried to put, you, would, you, so would you tried to put together a consortium you tried to put right. together a group that and, could be a buying we are okay. and you would you would probably bleep the responses I got from some of the Apple guys when I said we should sit down and talk, and uh, I can't repeat those here, but uh, they, don't be, they don't do business that way, especially with small carriers. I, I just think that a dialogue about how we can be a little more open. Uh, Look, I think it makes all the sense in the world that you've got to have the right kind of equipment to generate the right kind of consumer demand. And believe me, I, I mean, you know, when I first got into the wireless business, you'd ask people, well, who's your carrier? And they'd say, Motorola. Yeah, yeah, that's you know? right. Uh, so I understand the significance of, of what you're asking. Uh, why don't we move on real quick to uh, another issue that's one of your favorites, competition, competition, competition. And uh, I just hit on one issue there, and it, you know, it's, um, uh, I guess it's been four or five years since uh, the mobile um, uh, uh, competition report um, has failed to find the wireless industry effectively competitive. And um, I just wondered, it, 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 are we truly effective, competitive? Are we competitive in all the critical elements? And what can FCC do to encourage um, more effective competition in the wireless industry? Oh, wow. Um, so, uh, so clearly, I mean, we've been talking about 600 megahertz and, you know, the, the reserve was done for the purpose of having competition. You remember the letter that I wrote to yes. Congress in which I said, excuse me, let's understand what this is all about. This is about delivering service to rural areas um, because we have to have competition. You know, I think that when we came out with smaller license areas and smaller hunks of spectrum in both sets of auctions, that was you know, significant uh, in terms of, of promoting competition. Um, the um, the question about 
is the wireless industry fully competitive or demonstrably competitive or whatever kind of adverb uh, adjective you want to use? Um, it, 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 you, you, it depends upon what you're looking at. You know, yes, there may be four major carriers, four national carriers, and then the people in this room out going at specific competitive niches in their markets, which is absolutely fabulous. Um, but you know, competition. You and I are both old enough to remember um, the, um, the long distance wars, right? Yeah. That's what uh, effective telecommunications competition was about. You know, on, in, in, in April, you, you had AT&T, and in May, you had MCI, and in June, you had, you know, Sprint, and in July, you maybe went back to one of them or to somebody else. Um, we don't have that in telecom today. We've got tying plans. Mm -hmm that make it very difficult to go from one provider to another. And, um, and so as long as that kind of an environment exists, it seems to me that our job is to say, okay, what can we do through things like the, like the low band reserve to make sure that there is competitive capability there but at the same point in time, on the back end of that, once the, once the network is built, and the relationship with the consumer, um, what can we do to make sure that, that there is, um, is competitive alternatives? Because having a competitive choice the day you sign up, the day before you sign up for service, is not the same as having a competitive alternative than for the next, yeah. next number of fill-in-the-blank years. That's, the, that's the, the thing we have to work out insofar, is insofar as what competition was. I think, um, I think you're doing a great job on that. that we're, they're telling me we're running out of time, uh, but I wanted to give uh, two more, actually two more topics. One, um, you've got somewhere where around 1.3 million pen pals have been writing you on, on this particular issue. And, there, and I'm told that we're going to get another million this week. <clears throat> You're going to set new records for sure. Um, Janet Jackson's all upset. We've said wireless is different. Uh, we appreciate and we, uh, we agree with you that wireless is different. And um, I, I guess everyone would like to know, how do you take those wireless, those differences in wireless to account as you develop a, a net neutrality proposal? Well, as you know, in our proposal, we stuck with the decision that was made in the 2010 saying that wireless was different. Um, there has been a flood of comments um, from multiple players, including industry players, um, saying that things have changed dramatically, you know, that, in, that, that the number of of uh, LTE subscribers has changed and, and, and how you know, LTE is being marketed as a wireless internet access tool and asking the question, hey, the commission really ought to look at this anew. And we asked that yes. in, our, in our NPRM. We said, should we, should we do that? And, and we are. Well, thank you. And we, we commented and we'll continue to work. Um, I had a speed round. I don't know if we have enough time. You know, I'll answer fast. Okay, uh, you know, yes or no, or, or less than five seconds. Uh, will the AWS auction fully fund FirstNet? Yes. And will the incentive auction begin on your time frame? Ask the broadcasters. Yeah, which we will. <laughs> and uh, who's going to win the NCAA? Uh, NCAA oh, football? that's a cheap shot. You know, I, my, my arm's hurting today because I kept going, yay, tech, yay. And I should have realized that I should have been saying, whoa. Is our time up? No, no, it's not. <laughs> so uh, we had a tragedy at the shoe uh, on Saturday uh, with Virginia Tech. Um, but, um, but to answer your question, um, I think it's going to be uh, Florida State, Alabama. But I got to tell you, I was really impressed with Oregon on Saturday. Yeah. yeah. They looked pretty awesome against Michigan State. Well, that's pretty tough when you lose your first string quarterback. Um, 
Okay, you know, what's the most interesting, uh, pleasant surprise you've had since you've been chairman of the FCC at the, at the commission? What's one of the more pleasant surprises you've had? I get to work with really great people. And you know, I know that's always the, oh, that's, you know, he's weird. Yeah. The, the, the people at the commission are first rate. They've dedicated their lives to this. They are experts uh, in their field. Um, and then I was blessed with being able to pull around me in the chairman's office uh, and in some of the uh, key positions, like getting Roger to come in to run the wireless bureau yeah. after I moved Ruth Milkman up to be chief of staff, to have a really the the the. the the day-to-day -day group of, uh, uh, it's just, I mean, that's, that's the joy of coming to work to get a chance to re interact with those people. And, and I'm sure that they don't tire from your 24, 25 hour days. So that's good. Uh, why don't we go to the leadership? I want to wrap up with, you know, you're, you're a, 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 an expert on leadership. You've written a lot and talked a lot. And, and quite frankly, I think you're uh, in the book, you, uh, well, you've used to say a leader is someone who has to make a decision. And has to live with it. And, to be a leader, and, you've got to lead. And you and you have to do it with all your vim and vigor that, that you have. You know, it's, uh, Colonel John F. Rosby, <laughs> you know, the, the original disruptor, the original, uh, you know. One of my uh, all-time heroes, you know, John uh, Singleton yeah. Mosby. Uh, changed the rules of engagement uh, in, in, in the war. Um, sometimes I feel like our smaller carriers have to actually try to emulate uh, Mosby mm -hmm. in order to to be relevant and continue to survive in the marketplace. Any advice and counsel you'd like to give the, those, um, those innovators, these smaller carriers, what do they have to do to remain relevant and survive in, the, in this current market? Well, this book is about um, uh, leadership um, in the Civil War and how it compares with corporate leadership. Um, and, and one of the lessons, there are about nine lessons in the book, and one of the lessons in the book is yesterday's tactics are today's failures. And Mosby was the great example of that. He was a cavalry uh, 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 guerrilla. He was, a, he was a partisan ranger operating behind enemy lines. And, um, and while the Union cavalry insisted on using sabers, Mosby said, I'm going to use a six gun. <laughs> yeah. and, um, and he used to talk about, I had a great line, something to the effect that, 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 that the, their sabers, slashing at me with their sabers was as good as using corn stalks. Because he, his, the rangers would ride in and they'd be shooting folks up. So he changed the rules. The question is, it seems to me, that any business person has to face is, OK, how do you change the rules? How do you redefine? You know, and I'm not going to tell you or any of these people who have built successful companies how to do their job. But if you want to compete with a superior force, you've got to change the rules. Um, and I don't know what that rule change is. I don't know whether it's saying, hey, I'm the folks that can really provide 911 location accuracy, and they can't. I'm the one that has this angle on whatever the next uh, issue may be. What is it that you can do that forces them to respond to you. That was the great lesson, I, th I think, that, that, that Mosby had. Um, and um, so, uh, but, I, but I think there are a bunch of things that come, that, 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 that come into this. One is that uh, there's also a, a chapter about it's the next hill. You know, I mean, Stonewall Jackson became Stonewall Jackson at first Manassas um, because the Union troops um, thought they had won the battle. But they forgot that on the other side of Henry Hill was Stonewall Jackson coming up. And it changed the tide of the day. So it's always what's beyond the next hill. And then the other thing, and, and, and we try and talk about this at the commission as well. And this is probably an argument against interest. And this is not something that, uh, you know, a regulator normally goes around and talks about in public. But the first chapter in this book 
is entitled Dare to Fail. That if you're not willing to fail, you will. Because you will not have achieved that which might have been possible. And, you know, we've been sit sitting up here talking about a lot of difficult, poignant issues. And, um, and the attitude that we're trying to follow uh, is to say, you know, let's try it. With, not with a carelessness, not with a throw caution to the wind, not without good rationale. But if you don't try, you clearly won't. And if you try and make a mistake, you can fix it. And so, uh, and I think that that applies in business, it applies in what we do, um, and it's one of the things that makes life interesting. Mr. Chairman, I was going to ask you who is the most uh, influential FCC chairman in your opinion. I've got my own opinion uh, that we'll, I'll share in a couple years, but uh, <laughs> I think we're seeing it uh, in action so now. I, no, I think it's, it's interesting. Uh, uh, Dick Wiley clearly has had the most pervasive, I mean, he was general counsel, he was chairman, and then he has been ex officio chairman forever at the law firm. Um, I think Reed Hunt, in terms of impact during right. his term, Reed Hunt uh, uh, set the bar. Um, um, cable regulation, after Congress threw it to him, the first, first auction. spectrum auctions, right. and having to build that model, um, the uh, the E rate, and getting that up and running, which is a great legacy. Um, and then how you implement the Telecom Act of 96, which, as you know, right. was basically every time Congress got to a challenging point, the answer was, well, we'll let the FCC figure that out. Yeah. And so he had N plus one kind of challenges in a very short time frame. So, so I think that I think that that Reed is the is the the definitive and decisive FCC chairman of the modern era. Well, thank you. You know, I you're certainly not uh, shy at uh, taking on tough issues, and uh, and I, we appreciate your leadership. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you coming here staying with us and joining uh, our uh, competitive carriers. Thank you, and thank you, you know, the great job that the competitive carriers um, are doing. Um, and I know we don't always agree on everything, but the one thing we do agree on is competition, competition, competition. And when you change the name to be the Competitive Carriers Association, you send a message throughout Washington, hey, Here's a principle we stand for. It's not where we live, it's who we are. We're competitors. Thank you. Everybody, Chairman Tom Wheeler. <laughs> Mr. Chairman.